My senior year of high school, I signed up for cross country. I need the credits and thought, how difficult can this be? All you gotta do is run three miles, right? Well, I'd played soccer my whole life and this sport didn't have a ball. So I figured the learning curve was gonna be pretty simple. So the first day of the race came and I'd never run a race in my life up until this point, but I was eager, excited. And that starting gun went off and I sprinted straight to the top of the hill. Wouldn't let anyone pass me. Now I was intent on letting anybody pass me, even though I knew this wasn't a great idea. Everything I'd learned and trained was that uh, I was gonna run out of gas pretty quick here. But I didn't care in that moment. I thought, well, I'll just deal with that later. Well, later came pretty quick. After about a mile, I was pretty gassed. My legs were heavy. I was starting to lose confidence. People were passing me. After two miles, I was hardly even running at all. I guess technically I was running. Both feet were off the ground, but you could walk quickly past me. It was humiliating. I couldn't even fathom the idea of what my time was gonna be and how embarrassing that was gonna be with my teammates and the family who came out to watch. I needed some type of escape from this. And so I thought, well, my leg does feel like it's hurting a little bit. If I could just find my coach and, and convince him that, that I was in pain, maybe he'd let me stop. I could be out of this mess. And so that was my plan. Next time I see my coach, this is what I'm gonna do. And with about half mile left to go, I see him. I'm excited, this is gonna happen. And then he runs over to me, jumps in my face before I can get a word out, puts his three fingers and says, David, before this race is over, I want to see you pass three people. Go, 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 go. He didn't even get to give me a chance to argue. And I'm thinking, are you even watching this race? <laughs> How am I going to pass three people? I've been passed by 50 people in the last two minutes. But I figure he maybe saw something in me I didn't see in myself. He seemed confident. And so I went against my better judgment in that moment, put my head down, and I went for it. That last half mile, I passed one person, two person, three, 12 people in total. Now, that race for me wasn't defined by how I started. It was defined by how I finished. I finished it well. And of all the races I ran, that's the one that I remember most clearly. Not because of how I started or how I endured, but how I finished. And so today, we're going to look at the life of a man who immortalizes the patriarch of the most powerful, influential tribe in all of Israel. And he got there not because of a perfect life lived, but because of how he finished his life. He finished it well. Despite of all his failures, he ended well. Now, when we hear the word Judah, first and foremost, the patriarch is not usually the first person who comes to mind. It's typically the kingdom of Judah, which became synonymous with the southern kingdom of Israel. And beyond that, even just the tribe of Judah. But behind this kingdom and this tribe was a man. Now, this man was the fourth-born son of, of Jacob. He wasn't even the first. He wasn't the most preeminent son. But somehow, he received a great blessing from God and great privilege. Now, why was he so significant? Socioeconomic reasons could be pure chance, circumstantial. Social scientists and historians would probably give you a million reasons as to why Judah rose to the top in terms of its dominance of, in leadership in Israel. But if we want to know the true answer, we've got to turn to Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 10. Now here Jacob is at the end of his life. He's lived a long life, and he's giving blessings to each of his sons. Now these blessings were more than just uh, trite sayings. He was, he was speaking prophetically. They were prophetic utterances from God. And the utterances were talking about what would happen with each of the descendants of these men. And they were influenced by the life that the man had lived. And so let's take a look and see what Jacob has to say with Judah. Genesis 49, 8 through 10. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Neck of your enemies symbolizes uh, holding down the enemy, controlling them, exerting influence and power over them. He continues, your father's son shall bow down before you. Right, so Jacob's saying this blessing extends not only over your enemies, but over your own brothers. Judah would become the, the authoritative tribe over the other tribes. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people." Now, the key here is the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That scepter symbolizes uh, the monarchy, the power, the authority. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Between his feet is a euphemism from, from his loins, his descendants. 
Jacob is saying the power and prestige, the leadership is going to come from you and it's not going to pass away from you or the people who come after you until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, this is not just a blessing. This is, this is significant. This is the blessing. Jacob is saying that ultimately the Messiah is going to come from the line of Judah. Now, this is a honing in on that same promise that was made to, first to Adam and Abraham and through Isaac, not to Esau but to Jacob, and it's getting honed in even closer now to Judah. From Judah will come King David, and from Judah will come Jesus. Psalm 78, 68 through 70 speaks of the supremacy of the tribe of Judah. It says, He, that is God, rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. You see, Judah's prominence amongst his brothers was not circumstantial. There was no socioeconomic reason that was the root cause of this. It was intentional by God. God intended for this to happen. And in this text, we get a glimpse of that. We see that plan. Now, for us, it's not always the case. We don't always see what God's plan is. Like Job, we're ignorant to what's happening behind the scenes. And Judah was too in the life that he lived. He spent the first part of his life in opposition to God, but finished well by submitting to the will of him. Now Judah exemplifies the best of leadership in his family. He's recognized as such by God and by his father and receives the reward of perpetual leadership amongst the tribes of Israel. But of course, we've talked, Judah didn't start out this way. In fact, Judah's early life was marked by anything but the qualities that would look, we would look for in a godly leader. So let's turn now to Genesis 37 as we'll look at one of the earliest episodes of Judah's life. Now Jacob had 12 sons, six by Leah, two by Rachel and six by the servants of Rachel and Leah, respectively. Genesis 37, 2 through 4. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when the brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now this family obviously had internal strife. There was a level of dysfunction such that the, the brothers, it says, hated him. They couldn't even speak peacefully to him, yet they had to live with him. And all this was born out of a partiality on the part of the father. Jacob, seemingly ignorant of this, either ignorant or didn't care, Joseph, it says, gives a bad report of the men. We don't know if the report was true. We know that whether or not it was true or not, the other brothers would have been very upset at a tattletale, so to speak, this young boy, 17 though by now. In spite of that, it shows no response from Jacob other than he showed him greater partiality and made for him a robe. And this is what caused the author to state they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So it happened that one day his brothers set out for past to pasture his father's flock. Joseph was left behind, probably intentionally. But Jacob told Joseph, why don't you go find your brothers? Give me your report back and see what they're up to. Joseph, maybe naive, of course, grabbed his coat that his father had made and set out. Through a series of events, he found them in nearby Dothan. But as they saw him approach, they conspired against him. They determined in that moment, far away from home, far away from their father, that they were going to kill him. Now Reuben, being the oldest child, the oldest brother, advised them against this, and he said, let's not kill him, put him in a pit. Reuben's intention was to circle back later, perhaps rescue him and return him to his father. Whatever the case, Reuben was not able to accomplish this because in the next section here, he's actually gone. And as in his absence, Judah and the brothers recognize that there's Midianite traders approaching on the horizon. So Judah steps up. In verse 26, chapter 37, Judah says, Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. The great irony in this text is that Judah's trying to reason 
with them. He's our brother, our own flesh, so it's not reasonable for us to kill him. Yet somehow, they all agree that it's reasonable to sell him as a slave to Egypt. There's certainly amount of bias and delusion here. The despicable irony is that the same argument should extend to not selling him to slavery. But Judah doesn't get any accolades for this display of leadership. Verse 27 continues, And his brothers listened to him. Now, Judah was certainly influential over his brothers. This much is true. He was persuasive. He was a persuasive leader. They had a plan. Reuben had another plan. But they can, he was able to convince them that his plan was superior. Um, beyond that, he was pragmatic. Judah recognized that there was really no point, and there's no benefit to kill him. That would be impractical also. You'd have to physically kill him, and you'd carry that blood guilt with you, and you'd get nothing for him. But when he saw these people approaching, he thought, well, we might as well make something off of him. It's a solution that worked. Furthermore, he'd be sending his problem down to Egypt. It would go away. It would be gone. Finally, he was an opportunist. When Reuben was present, he didn't voice any opposition. At least we don't see that. Now Reuben's gone, and he, it, he takes this chance to exert his influence, his leadership. Now Judah was a decent leader. These are all qualities you'd want to see in a leader, someone who's willing to be pragmatic, to get the job done, who is persuasive, able to convince and influence others, and also someone who is an opportunist, someone who sees an opportunity and seizes it. Unfortunately, what Judah lacked was godliness. He was leading them, but leading them in the wrong direction. Judah was a decent leader, but he lacked godliness. Ultimately, Judah's plan prevails. Joseph is sold into slavery. The brothers had an animal murdered, dipped his coat in the blood, and handed it to their father. Their father was distraught, thinking, assuming that he'd been torn apart by beast. It seems as if, for the time, for the moment, that Judah and the brothers' plan was successful. Next, the text describes Judah as moving away from his brothers. In Genesis 38, we see a profile of Judah's life. Now, he moves away to a place called Adullam, gets married, has three sons, the eldest of which is named Er. He takes a wife for her, named Tamar. But Er is wicked in the eyes of God, and God strikes him down. We don't know what his sin was. Now, back then, they had a uh, process called leveret marriage, whereby the next in line, the next son, would marry the widow of the deceased older brother. This is to ensure that the descendants would continue from the older brother and they would share in the benefits and blessings. And also that the widow would have provision, security, still be part of the family. So Onan is the next brother in line. He's tasked with marrying her, getting her pregnant, and continuing, perpetuating his brother's line. Now he's more than happy and willing to sleep with her, but he is unwilling and deceptive to the point where he's not actually going to get her pregnant. Now, she doesn't know this, but God sees this. Repeated deception. And God strikes him dead as well. Now, by now, Judah, seeing two of his sons killed, being with the same woman, is suspicious and supposes that Tamar is the reason for their death. He supposes that she is the threat to the line of Judah, to his lineage and his receiving of the promises of Israel. So his third son, he holds back from her, suggesting that he's too young. But when he's of age, she'll give him over to her. He has no intention of doing this and sends Tamar away. Like he sent Joseph down to Egypt, he sends Tamar back to her family. Doesn't take her out of her responsibility to the family. Doesn't allow her to go marry somebody else. But leads her on to believe that he's going to give her his youngest son when he's of age. Now, eventually, Judah's own wife dies. Tamar hears of this and consents that the line of Judah is is under threat here. Still no word from Judah regarding the third son. She decides to take off her widow garments, put on a veil, and go to a nearby town where she knows Judah will be. She disguises herself with a veil. Now, he approaches, having just lost his wife, and asks to sleep with her. She agrees. He doesn't know who she is. But she takes a pledge from him, a signet, ring, his staff, and the cord of his robe. A collateral, so to speak. The equivalent of taking someone's wallet, driver's license. 
Now when they're done, she departs. He doesn't get back his things. And he realizes this and sends his servant. He doesn't even go back himself because he doesn't want to bear the shame of having to inquire regarding what he presumed to be a prostitute. So he sends his servant. His servant inquires with the locals and they say, there is no prostitute that's been here. At this point, Judah says, call it off. Well, I'm not going to bother. He doesn't want to have to get into, at this point now, a sex scandal. Better to lose those things than to deal with the sin, the consequences of that sin. Three months later, Tamar starts showing. She's obviously pregnant. The servants come in. They notified, they notified Judah, who's still under obli- or Tamar still under obligation to her, his third son. And they say, Tamar's been immoral. She's been with somebody else. She's pregnant. Judah immediately, there's a telling response in verse 26. He says, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila, and he did not know her again. Now, there's a notable change here in Judah's life. The old Judah, what he'd been doing up until this point, was kicking the can down the road, dealing with this problem later. But that's not what he does here. For the first time, we see him face-to-face with this sin, and he accepts it. He takes responsibility. Now, he could have... uh, Yes, this is his staff and cord and, and ring, but he could have denied it, or he could have accused her of stealing it. But he didn't do either of those things. He accepted with humility, knowing that his sin had now been exposed by conceding this. He didn't just confess the sin of adultery or infidelity. Rather, he confessed, he looked further back and said that she's more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila. Now, Judah, in this moment, recognizes his true sin, which was that he was, by denying Tamar, his son, He was standing in the way of God's plan. He accused Tamar in his heart of doing this. But it was him. And he sees his hypocrisy and that he was working in opposition to God's will. Furthermore, we know this is true repentance. It says, and he did not know her again. We need to confess humbly when confronted with sin. There will be a moment when we're all confronted might be on the road or by a, by a spouse or a coworker or a boss. And we, we've got to deal with that. And it's easy sometimes to admit our shortcomings in private or to God in prayer. It's not so simple when our confession would also indict us or implicate us. Sort of like a child who's stolen something. The parents ask, just bring it forward. But no one stands up because they know that by it, bringing it forward and returning it, they'd be admitting guilt. So they return it in the middle of the night to its rightful spot. That's easier to do, but that's not what Judah did. Here we have a humble confession. He's confessing sin when confronted with it, even when it costs him something publicly, socially. He's not kicking the can down the road anymore. We also must humbly recognize our shortcomings. Now, from this point on, Judah seems revitalized in his leadership. So we need to fast forward our narrative a little bit here. Since this episode, a famine has struck the region. Joseph has been made leader in Egypt and is put in charge of all the grain distribution. They're running out of food in Canaan, and so Jacob has the brothers go down to Egypt to get food. However, he keeps Benjamin with him, Benjamin being the younger son of, of Rachel, the brother of Joseph. So we see Jacob hasn't changed a whole lot here. He's now, he's probably weary of sending Benjamin down because the last time his son of Rachel was alone with these brothers, he ended up presumably killed. Now when they get there, Joseph recognizes the brothers, but they don't recognize him. Joseph, curious about the state of his full brother Benjamin and his father, inquires without revealing his identity. He supposes that the brothers are lying. Finds out that they have a brother. Accuses them of being spies. Tells them, if you leave Simeon with me, this brother, then you guys go back. Get Benjamin, who you're alleging is real, and bring him to me. Brothers depart. Immediately upon arriving back at Jacob, Reuben tries to persuade his father to let Benjamin go with him. He wants, of course, to bring back Simeon from captivity. 
Reuben emotionally and desperately pleads with him, but Jacob is not willing. Reuben even offers to have his two sons killed if anything happens to Benjamin. Now, Jacob can see right through this. This is an insincere claim by Reuben. Certainly, why would he have his two kids killed? That is ridiculous, first and foremost. And second of all, how would that be any consolation to a, a grieving father to have their grandchildren killed also? There's an insincerity in Reuben's tone. He seems desperate to reestablish his leadership. Eventually, the famine gets worse, and they get hungry. They're running out of food. Jacob approaches the brothers again and says, You've got to go down to Egypt. Judah steps up and reminds him that in order to do that, Benjamin must go with them. Judah, of course, is hesitant. Sorry, Jacob is hesitant. And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Jacob agrees because Jacob trusts Judah. He can sense the sincerity in his voice. So we need to be also people who are resolved to boldly commit to godly self-sacrifice. This is a big commitment on part of Judah, one that could be very costly. He knows that in Egypt, one brother has been imprisoned and the man down there has not been kind to them. There is a chance that he isn't able to bring Benjamin back, and he knows it, yet he still makes this assertion to his father. He doesn't stand by and say nothing. He doesn't offer people that are not himself. He doesn't nominate one of his other brothers, but he leads in a godly way by offering himself to be that pledge. He was prepared to suffer for his family. He knew the risk was real, but the stakes were high. He stood up like a man and exerted godly, biblical self-sacrifice. We lay down our lives for our children, for our spouses, and for those we serve. We ought to do so with joy, knowing that it's difficult work. We must boldly commit to sacrificing for the lives of others as Christ sacrificed his life for us. By Genesis 44, 14, the narrator recognizes Judah as the leader of Israel. The text reads, When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. When Judah and his brothers... This is like saying Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. These are Robin Hood and his merry men. Judah is in the dominant position here. He's the preeminent one. He's the, the leader of these group, group of men. Numbers 10.14 expands on this. Judah is listed as the first company to set out from Mount Sinai. In Judges 1, 1 through 2, it reads, After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. So this starts in Genesis 44.14, the recognition of leadership of Judah. Now they arrive in Egypt again, hosted for a feast, and Joseph receives them well. They have a good dinner. Things seem to be going good. Simeon is returned to them. They say goodbye and set back out for, for Canaan to see Jacob. However, before they leave, Joseph sneakily puts his cup in Benjamin's bag. Now after they departed, Joseph sends his servants after him. The servants arrive and accuse the brothers of stealing. The brothers, of course, deny it. They don't know of any wrongdoing. And they agree to let the servants of Joseph search the bags. Now, lo and behold, they find the cup in Benjamin's bag. What are they going to do? More importantly, what's Judah going to do? This is where the rubber meets the road. They were so close to the promised land, literally. And they all head back to Egypt. Now, upon arriving in Egypt, Joseph steps forward. Genesis 44, verse 4. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, 
What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also, in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose cup, hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Judah, once again, stepping up into a leadership position to address Joseph directly. Bearing the responsibility for the alleged crime. Then Judah went up to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not, let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord, his servant asked his, my Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, Go again and buy us a little food, we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our younger brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces, and I've never seen him since. If you take this one also from me and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs and evil to Sheol. Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your, servant be, for your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord. And let the boy go back to his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Judah no longer has regard for his self-interest. This speech, one of the longest in Genesis, shows that his priorities now in leadership are for other people. He's demonstrating a godly, self-sacrificial leadership. In years past, if he hadn't truly been transformed, he would have probably tried to wiggle out of this somehow. Make up some excuse, abandon Benjamin. But he doesn't do that. He keeps his commitment. He keep, keeps his promise, takes responsibility. His yes is yes and his no is no. He's now a man of integrity. One who's able to lead well and give himself up for his brothers. Now Judah here keeps his word, not because he presumed Benjamin to be innocent. In fact, at this point, Judah doesn't know there's any deception. He thinks Benjamin is guilty yet he's still willing to sacrifice himself. He did this because he loved his father. His father, he made a commitment to him, and he's executing that mission. Now, with us, Christ doesn't save us because we're innocent. In fact, we are guilty. He saves us because he came here to do his father's work, even at the expense of his own comfort up on that cross. This is the reason that Judah is exalted above his brothers. He submitted in obedience to God when put through the fire. He was refined into the leader that God needed him to be. We know the history of our people, and the tribe of Judah knew the history of theirs. The line of Judah from whom the Messiah would come, though marked by early failure, Judah did not give up. He was challenged and persevered. Judah finished well. Likewise us, we don't have to be defined by those failures in our life. Whether they were yesterday or six years ago or an eternity ago. But we need to be sure that wherever we are, we finish well. As Judah did. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word. Thank you for all your words, Lord. We just pray that you would help to apply this to our lives to know that 
we have been sent here to do a work, Lord, to do your work. I pray that however we've done it up until now, Lord, that we'd be people who would be willing and able and determined to finish well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.